Hello everyone and welcome to Hamwell Zoo. Thank you so much for joining us again today. We are back with the Meerkat. If you remember, three short weeks ago, we started this curriculum, Key Stage 1 and Key, key Stage 2 based series with the Meerkat, looking at similarities and differences between mammals and other classes of animals like amphibians, reptiles, birds, fish, invertebrates and the mammals. Um, then we moved on to diets with the lemurs and we learned about all their favourite foods and the foods that they like to eat in the wild. Then last week we were with the chickens looking at life cycles. This week we're back with the meerkats because we get so many questions about our wonderful mob of meerkats that we thought we'll come back to answer any questions that went unanswered. But we can also look at habitats which is um, a really, really important part of not just um, an animal's life cycle, um, but, uh, but also in conservation. Knowing an animal's habitat and learning about their habitat, about their needs and um, their requirements, but also their adaptations. So adaptations are mutations in, um, in animals that happen over lots and lots and lots of generations, quite often millions of years. And those adaptations help that animal survive within a, a specified habitat. And the one thing that does um, for us as conservationists is it helps us identify what that animal is suited to. So if an animal has really, really large wings, it probably flies. If an animal um, is really adept at walking and has short, stout feet that can scurry along, it probably spends a lot of its life on the floor. If the animal is waterproof, it probably spends its time in a habitat where there's lots of water around, so either a lake or the ocean or somewhere that rains a lot. So today we're going to be looking at the meerkat habitat. Um, so as we know, meerkats are from the continent of Africa. They can be found in um, southern Africa um, and they like to live in lots, several different habitats, but usually a habitat that we like to call the savanna. And the savanna is very similar to the space we've created at Hanwell Zoo for our mob of meerkats. Um, I just want to mention, if you've got any questions about the meerkats, or about habitats, or diets, or life cycles, or differences between the different classes of animals and their similarities, pop them in the comments below and we'll try to uh, answer as many as possible. So the savanna is a really, really... Um, sparse habitat. It's, it's usually very, very flat. And one way that meerkats have adapted to that flat, flat savanna, to be able to see as far as possible, they've learned to stand up on end. So that's one adaptation. They use their really strong tail to help them balance. And that's one ad adaptation that they use to help survive in that habitat by being able to see really far. They can help protect their family. Another, um, another other adaptation with their vision are their eyes. If you can see, if I try to get, who do we have here? If I try to get Arthur to look at the camera, you can see around his eyes, they've got quite small eyes, but they are surrounded by a really dark black fur. And that's an adaptation um, where it absorbs the sunlight. So in the savanna in Africa, it's really, really bright. By having those dark patches around their eyes, they act as a um, as like sunglasses. So that helps the glare from the sun be absorbed into their skin, so they can be able to see a bit a bit further. If you imagine the way adaptations work, is they're quite random. So um, as with humans child will take a little bit of um, some genetics from their parents, um, from, from their mother and one from their father, but they don't look exactly like them. They'll have slight changes, and that's exactly the same with, with, um, with all, all animals. So if you imagine, if a litter of meerkats were born and they all had really pale eyes, but one of them was born with really dark eyes, the most successful meerkat be the one with the dark eyes so they can see really really far and the sun won't glare too much so because that meerkat will be the most successful 
that meerkat will probably be the one who will then be the strongest, take over the group, and have young themselves, who will be, probably have those dark rings around their eyes. The same to go through their pattern on their back. It's quite mottled and stripy, and one of the reasons they have that is that it helps them blend in with their habitat. It helps them camouflage um, amongst the sand and the sand color rocks and all the dry grass. <coughs> so if a predator were to come along, and spot the meerkats, it would be difficult to pinpoint one because they blend in with their surroundings so well. And again, that's another adaptation that um, prey animals um, help, uh, have developed over millions and millions of years, or hundreds of thousands of years with the meerkats, um, for instance, to help protect them. So if you imagine, again, if, the, if, if a meerkat had a litter, um, so five or six babies, say, um, and one of them had this sand and brown colored stripy pattern on their backs and the other ones were bright blue the bright 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 blue ones would probably get spotted by a predator and be eaten quite young whereas the ones with the adaptation of camouflage will help will be able to hide and hopefully have young when they're a little older so there's lots and lots and lots of different adaptations that animals can have one task that I think everyone might enjoy at home today is try to think of as many adaptations in as many different animals as you can and how those adaptations help that animal survive in the wild. So for instance, you can look at bird beaks to see the different shapes of bird beaks and the different foods that different shapes of beak might eat and that helps them survive in the wild. You can look at different camouflage adaptations to see how that helps those specific animals who have that camouflage adaptation in the wild survive. You can look at animals with shells and how that adaptation might protect them uh, from predators. You can look at animals with different shaped legs and arms. So do they have long arms um, for swinging in the trees or do they have big strong legs to help them run? Or do they have flippers to help them swim? Do they have wings to help them fly? There are so many different adaptations. So the best thing to do for this, um, for this task is if you choose some of your favorite animals and have a really good look at them and see what adaptations they have that help them survive in the wild. It helps them hide, help them eat, help them move about their space and help them protect each other. And if you've got any questions about those, you can pop those in the comments below and we'll answer, we'll answer them all this evening. So if anyone's got any questions today, pop them in the comments below and we'll try to answer as many as possible. I'll hand over to Jim to ask if there are uh, any questions. Someone's asked, why do they live in burrows? Well, in, uh, where they live in Africa, it can get really, really hot during the day and it can also get really quite cold at night time. So living in burrows underground, which they dig with these incredible, I'll see if I can try and show you. If you can see against my hand, they've got really long, sharp nails and that they're brilliant adaptations for digging in hard clay or sand. And they dig these wonderful burrows underground where they have kitchens and they have latrines or toilets and they have sleeping areas. Um, they build really, really diverse burrows for the whole family to live in. And one thing that does, it keeps them warm when it's very cold in the evening, but it also is a place where they can hide during the day to keep them cool when, it, when the sun's at its hottest and it gets really, really quite steamy in, in, in the savannah. The other reason is protection. It's a really, underground is a really safe place to, um, to sleep. So if during the day there's a predator, they will stand up and go on sentry duty which means they will have a really good look with their wonderful eyes all around the savannah. And if anyone spots danger coming along on the horizon or from the sky, they'll let out a little chirping alarm call and that will tell everybody in the family to run for cover. So that burrow can act as um, a place of safety. Um, and when they're sleeping, of course, in the evening, um, it's quite a safe place to sleep, um, especially because what some of their predators like jackals or cats or um, birds of prey find it difficult to get to them under those burrows so by living underground in burrows that's another adaptation that keeps them nice and safe 
And someone has also asked, how far do they, they travel in a day? Oh, that's a good question. So, as with any animal, they will only travel as far as they need to. So, um, if an animal needs to breed on the other side of the world, um, say, so maybe a migrating bird, they travel really, really, really far. With the meerkats, if all of their food is, it, is it within a small space, they won't travel further than that space. If they've got everything they need, there's no need to endanger themselves by traveling far away from their burrow um, if they don't need to. So as with most animals, um, they will only travel as far as is essential. With meerkats, in the, in the savannah, sometimes, especially during really hot summers, food can get quite scarce. So when food gets scarce, they have to travel much, much, much farther. But usually, an, a meerkat's territory is around about a square kilometre, um, and they usually won't travel further, um, further than that. And hopefully, all, everything they need will be within that, within that space. But they try to stay as close to home as possible. Skylar has asked, what do they eat? Hello, Skylar. So in the wild, um, it's really, really similar to what they eat here. We try to emulate, we try to copy what they eat in the wild as much as possible so they exhibit lots of natural behaviours and they get all the nutrients, all the good vitamins and minerals that, they're, that they, they, they need. So at the moment, just so they're nice and camera friendly and they, um, you can see them at home, I'm feeding them their favourite, which are these mealworms. And mealworms are the larvae stage, so the baby stage, of an insect called a darkling beetle. And it's got lots and lots of tasty fats in them and they're the, they're the meerkat's absolute favourite, as you can see. But it's really important to give them a really healthy, balanced diet. So as I mentioned, we emulate, we copy what they eat in the wild, and meerkats are omnivores, which means they like to eat lots of different kinds of things. So they eat lots of um, insects and invertebrates. They like fruit and vegetables, and we give them seeds and nuts. They also eat a bit of meat, so in Hamwell Zoo we give them chicken and mice. In the wild, that meat might come from um, snakes or small birds or amphibians like frogs and newts. Sometimes they'll eat um, eggs, so we give them an egg once a week as a treat. Um, and they also like to eat... Oh, so, hello. <laughs> and also um, here, just to make sure we give them all the nutrients they need, we get a really special biscuit made. It's very different for, from our biscuits, but we get a really special biscuit made just for meerkats, um, and they find that really, really tasty too. And then on top of all of that, we make sure they've got lots of lovely fresh water to drink so they can stay really, really healthy. But their absolute favorite foods are these mealworms and carrots. And Arthur, who is this one, Arthur's favourite, favourite fruit is tomato. He loves tomatoes. And someone's come up with a good one, because there's very bright colours behind them. Yep. Would this scare them? Ah, oh, that is, that's a really good question. So we are very, very conscious to make our animals as happy as possible. Every animal here at Hamwell Zoo is here for a reason. Um, obviously there are some animals that are more popular than others and those animals, like the meerkats, help us generate a revenue that help us protect some of the world's most endangered animals. Meerkats aren't endangered in the wild, although their habitat is in danger from human encroachment, so human activity and also climate change. Um, there's enough in the wild that, they'll, um, that they're, in the near future they should be able to sustain themselves. Um, so the other animals in, within the zoo are here for either education, research, or conservation reasons. And we always, so they're all here for a reason, and we try to make them feel as at home as possible. So we try to emulate their um, environment as much as possible. With the, um, with the murals, the bright colors um, they're very, very much used to, um, meerkats can see in quite a wide spectrum and they're very used to seeing lots of different bright colours and they use that as another adaptation, they use that adaptation to help, um, to help them identify 
watch is what, so they know that big red thing is a certain bird, or that large grey animal is a rhino, or that stripy black and orange, uh, well, uh, that um, sandy colour big animal is a, is a, is a lion. So um, they, um, they can, <laughs> um, so they, they, they see really, really well. We're very careful with how, when we introduce things that they wouldn't necessarily meet in the wild, um, or see in the wild, we're very careful um, with what we introduce. But our meerkats are really calm and settled, and we started the mural very slowly, and they haven't noticed it at all. Because it's static, it doesn't move, it's just part of their surroundings. It's something um, all of the humans that come to the zoo can enjoy and um, it makes, it brightens up the place a little, but it doesn't, it doesn't scare them. And there's another couple of questions about, very good ones as well, can meerkats climb? Meerkats are not very good climbers. They can climb, but they're more designed, they're more adapted to running quickly on a flat surface. There's lots of flat surface in the savanna, and their body over hundreds of thousands of years, or tens of thousands of years has adapted to running quickly across flat surfaces down into their burrow. And as I mentioned earlier, they've got those long, long, long fingernails that help them dig dry soil or sand. And those long fingernails aren't very good at gripping on to climb them, to, to climb things. So within this space here, we've got lots of logs and rocks for them to meander over, to clamber over, and they can, they can jump um, up on, onto things and walk along things and they've got great balance. When they are um, walking around, they'll use that tail up in the air to help them balance and navigate their surroundings. But they're not, I wouldn't say they're the best climbers. So they can climb a little bit, but they're not the best at it. They're probably just as good of a climber as I am and I'm not a very good climber at all. And how long, how long was it they live? On average, in the wild, on average, meerkats will live to about four or five. All of our meerkats are six and seven years old because in captivity, we've got the benefit of plentiful food. So and we don't have any droughts or famines um, at the zoo. So they have food provided for them every day. Um, they've got lots of space to exercise in, so they stay nice and healthy. We've got several vets that help look after all of our animals here at Hamwell Zoo, and that keeps them nice and healthy. We give them really good quality food, making sure they're nice and healthy as well. And also, they benefit from not having any predators here at the zoo. So although they will always still look out for predators, sometimes um, you'll see them looking up into the sky because we get quite large birds here um, in the area. We get lots of owls and other birds of prey like um, red kites and sparrow hawks and peregrine falcons, none of which would um, bother really taking a meerkat. So, um, and if they would, they would see them and they could run inside into safety. So our meerkats are really, really well protected. So we um, estimate that they will probably live to an average age of about 11 or 12, which is much, much older than what they would live in the wild. But that's because they're afforded so much uh, protection here at the zoo. And uh, another good question is how heavy are they? Ah, that is a really, really good question. So we've got five meerkats. The largest meerkat is Stephen. Um, and he is a, um, he's 1,200 grams, and we have our smallest meerkat is Titch, and Titch is just over 800 grams. So around about, if you imagine uh, a kilo of sugar in a bag, the meerkats on average weigh around about um, around about one kilo um, uh, one kilo each. Probably on the lighter side of that, but just to give you an idea at home, that's how much that's how much they weigh. Um, we've, we've got a question from Leo, but I'll, I'll let you answer that later. Uh, someone uh, has also been asking uh, what their names are. Their names are, this is, this is Chiku, and she's our, she's our female. The others are all exploring their space now. Arthur and Titch are digging, are digging a hole for, us for some reason. <laughs> if you want to scan around and see, you'll see just how good they are at digging. So this is Arthur and Titch. And, um, um, and um, you can see just how quickly, just in the past few minutes that I've been talking, 
they've decided to dig a little hole. <laughs> Maybe they've smelt a, a tasty worm or something down there and um, that's what they're digging for. So we have Chiku, who, like, as I said, is our only female. We have Stephen, Rex, Arthur and Titch. Um, and they're, they're the names of our five of our five new cats. Lovely. And um, which is the oldest, I think, is the final question. The eldest is the female, Chiku. She is seven, she's coming up to eight. Um, and she's from a different family from the boys. All of the boys are brothers. They were all born in the same litter and they are all six coming up to seven in, in a few months. Um, so the eldest one is Chiku by about a year. Um, the, uh, we've got another question as well insofar as do they get scared by the other animals around the zoo? Meerkats are really, really inquisitive and one of their one of their most successful traits, one of their most successful adaptations is how well they protect each other as a family. So the only reason they've done so well um, during evolution and out in the wild, the only reason they've done really well is because they protect each other. And that takes a lot, uh, a lot of evolution and adaptations to come up with that behavior and all the adaptations that you need to do that successfully. So, because they've adapted that over, so, over such a long period of time, they are naturally, um, I wouldn't say nervous animals, but they're naturally cautious animals. But along with that, they're also really, really inquisitive. So when they hear a sound that might be unusual to them, so more recently we, we got a pair of donkeys um, that came to live with, live with us at Hamwell Zoo last year. Uh, last year or the year before? Oh, I forget what you were in now. Last, Last year. year. <laughs> um, and donkeys, as we all know, make that really loud braying sound, that large e eeyore sound. And when the donkeys started making that sound, even though they're on the other side of the zoo, you could hear it from the meerkats. And it didn't scare them. Um, they, were, they would run up to the window to see if they could see where that sound was coming from or who was making that sound. So they were more, they were more inquisitive. Um, again, with thousands and thousands of years of adaptations and um, evolving in a certain environment, there are certain sounds, and more particularly there are certain shapes that meerkats are more afraid of. Um, and that's one thing that we are very cautious of when we are painting murals, is that silhouettes of large birds of prey are very different from silhouettes of other kinds of birds that they might see in the wild. So we wouldn't paint a silhouette. So a silhouette is sort of like a shadow, the outline of an animal. And when they're looking up in the bright savannah sun, that's what they see. They see that dark shadowy silhouette in the sky. And they've learned which ones to be afraid of and which ones not to be afraid of. So here at the zoo, when a sparrow hawk or a peregrine falcon or um, a red kite flies over, they do get scared. They just see that silhouette and they get scared and they run into safety to help protect themselves. Um, but when um, another large bird like a corvid, so a crow or a magpie might fly over, they don't, um, they're not scared of those at all because they're a very, very different shape. One thing that they are scared of um, here at the zoo are gulls. We've got quite a few gulls, mainly herring gulls and um, mast gulls that live um, around the river and the lakes um, in the surrounding parks. Um, and there's a large number. This morning there were, they were around, uh, around 30 or 40 black mast gulls um, on the lake. And they are scared of those when they fly over. Whether that's because they look like the shape of a bird of prey or whether it's because there aren't many gulls, um, if any, um, in the areas they live in Africa. So it's just such an unusual shape to them, they'd better be safe rather than sorry. So they scurry on, um, they scurry on inside. But um, just to go back to your question to make sure I've answered it, with the sounds in the zoo, um, they're more curious than scared, but if they are scared, there is a period where they'll get used to the sounds um, if it's scaring them, and then they realize because they're safe, there's nothing to be scared about. But we're, we're always very, very conscious when we're, new, when we're introducing new shapes or sounds um, or, or any, anything visual, really, into the zoo to make sure that the animals feel as comfortable as possible. And, and the final question is from Eloisa. 
Um, and that is, what are their main predators? Hello, Eloisa. Um, meerkats are very small, and there's lots of them in their habitats. So we've got five in our mob or our family here at Hanwell Zoo. But in the wild, there's usually around about 20 or 30. Sometimes there can be more than 50 in really large families, but usually there's about 20 or 30. And they're quite, um, as I mentioned, they're quite small. So they're the favorite prey, they're the favorite food of quite a lot of animals. Where they live in Africa, um, there are lots of predators. There's lots of um, birds of prey, um, so eagles, um, and hawks and owls that might um, quite like to eat them. Um, there are also snakes um, who meerkats are really good at fighting off, but snakes are really interested in eating meerkats. And there's also um, mammals, um, so there are some cats. They're a little bit small for lions to bother with, but if lions were very hungry um, and um, they were agile enough, they would certainly try for, um, try for a meerkat. But, and there are also um, different kinds of um, dogs around that live in Africa, so painted dogs or jackals, um, quite like meerkats as a little snack. So meerkats have to protect themselves from lots of different kinds of animals that come from lots of different places. Um, so they've had to develop lots and lots of different adaptations to be able to protect themselves, not only from all around, but from the sky too. I think I just have to mention we have had a number of messages on here from different sites. We'll try and work on that. Oh, I see. Time. Yeah, recently um, our, uh, all of our broadcasts have attracted the attention of um, whether they're spammers or scammers, who knows. But um, we will only ever broadcast from our main channels, whether that's Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or direct um, from our website. We won't we won't broadcast from a third party, so we will never share um, links. Um, perhaps at a time where we will share a link, but if anyone other than Hanwell Zoo posts a link, don't press on it. Um, we, yeah, we, we've been picked up by quite a few um, scams in that way. Hopefully no one's clicked on them. Hopefully we're all savvy enough to know that if you don't know what that link is going to, we don't, we, we don't press it. But certainly for these broadcasts, we will always post directly as Hanwell Zoo from Hanwell Zoo. And we've not we've had a few scams in the past. We've not had any scams with our um, we're running a fundraiser to help us look after our animals during this really difficult lockdown for us at the moment, as it is for everybody. I've not noticed any scams with our um, with our fundraiser. But as again, we will only ever ask um, uh, for any sort of attention, whether it's our broadcast or whether it's our fundraiser, direct from our page, not from third party. So if it doesn't say Hanwell Zoo, it's not from us. Super. Thank you all so much for your questions. If I didn't answer your question in today's video, still pop it in the questions in the comment box below um, because we will answer them this afternoon or as, or as soon as we possibly can certainly by this evening thank you so much for joining us um, because it's going to be half term shortly we're going to take a short break um, we all of the videos we've done over the past 10 months now and there's lots and lots of content there we've seen most of the animals here that live at Hanwell Zoo and we've certainly been concentrating on lots and lots of national curriculum topics specifically aimed at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 um, learners. So if you haven't seen them all or you would like a bit of a refresher, you can go back um, into our video library on, um, on Facebook um, and have a look at all of those videos. There's, sorry, I've got the hiccups now. There's lots and lots of content, um, lots of content there. Um, we will take a short break. We don't know when we're going to be opening again, um, as with the rest of us. We, you know, we're just waiting for news. Until then, everybody stay safe um, and look after yourselves and follow the rules, and hopefully we can get back to some sort of normality as soon as possible. Just mentioning our fundraiser, thank you so much to everybody who has donated so far. It really, really is helping us through this really, really difficult time, helping us still run our conservation efforts as well as look after the incredible um, animals that call Hamwell Zoo home. So until next time, thank you so much for joining us again and we will see you very, very soon. See you later everybody. Bye bye.